All right, I think we pretty much have everyone. Let me give the lay of the land for right now and for today's office hours. First off, sorry for the long break in office hours. We had a lot of head down work to do um, and now we're back at it. I think very exciting times here. Today, what we wanted to do was invite the Nimble Navigators team to speak. They've launched an incredible product, the Hourglass product, which was a receiver of the first, fourth grant. Um, this is now launched and live. So we wanted them to talk about it for maybe the next 10, 15 minutes, give an overview of the product and a bit about how they think it can impact the space. Um, it's something we're very excited about and, and thrilled to have them chat about. Then what we'll wanna do is have the Buttonwood guys uh, join on stage with the Ample guys as well. And obviously the Nimble Navigators team to have a discussion about the tech and where things are heading uh, because a lot of Buttonwood tech is being used Obviously, it's being used in spot. Um, it's being used with Hourglass as well. And there's a really strong ecosystem here between uh, the three projects and actually many more different projects in the future. And then there's also a proposal out that we'll want to discuss as well. Um, so we'll do that at the very end. It's a fourth proposal, which I'll link in the chat. Or if someone else wants to link that, they can go ahead and do that. So that's the plan for today. Thrilled to have everybody join. We're going to record it and put it up on YouTube so that people outside of this time zone can catch up on what's being discussed. Um, so yeah, if you guys want to go ahead, Bear Muller, Sun Breather, GS, and, and run through the deck, um, that would be awesome. Yeah, thank you. Um, so today, uh, just... I don't think you can screen share in here, which is totally fine. Um, I think we're just going to do a quick verbal run through um, without any visual aids at the moment. If you want to put uh, the doc in the uh, general channel, if you're comfortable with that, uh, people can filter through. And then I can also try to put up on the recording. That's a, that's a your choice. Okay. Um, I'm not entirely sure if I have that readily available, but maybe there were G can link to something. Um, so uh, just a, I know we've talked about um, our project before, and I'm sure a lot of people in this community are well aware of uh, what we've been up to. But for anyone who's new, um, the Hour of the Last team uh, could consist of myself, but I go by Sun Breather in Discord. Um, we have GS and Bear Mauler. And um, over the last year, we've been building out Hourglass, which is um, a convertible bond market um, built on top of Buttonwood. And um, the sort of our story is we all came together um, last year. Well, actually, it was uh, GS, myself, and Cold Press, and um, Sun Amber. We were the original team who entered the hackathon, uh, the, the chain link fall hackathon last year, where we built the first concept of Hourglass and uh, won the Ample Fourth category um, and prize for uh, building out this first iteration of Hourglass. Um, unfortunately, after the hackathon, uh, Sun Amber and Cold Press had to step down. And so we brought on Bear Mahler, where uh, he's been helping us uh, build out um, basically this live version of Hourglass that we have deployed now. And so um, some of our motivation for doing this is um, we wanted to build a fixed rate, fixed term, zero liquidation uh, platform um, for borrowing and lending. And of course, uh, there's button zero, which is very similar. Um, However, uh, as some of you are aware, they use Uniswap um, in the background, which can uh, be a problem if there's uh, such low liquidity that the borrower can't actually buy back uh, their tranches um, to repay back their loan. And so uh, with Hourglass, we've worked with them to build out a system where um, borrowers are guaranteed the liquidity needed to pay back their loan. Um, and so we hope this, uh, 
finds its place in the market um, where DAOs will be able to um, take out loans to pay for any expenses and know that uh, they won't have to worry about any liquidity issues in the future. Um, also, part of our motivation for this was just recognizing that there is a great need in the space uh, to put to use idle governance tokens that are a, a lot of times just sitting in a wallet doing nothing. Um, so Hourglass is another way uh, for DAOs to take that, basically all that capital that's just there not doing anything and use it in a way that's friendly to them and the lenders and they're not sort of um, sort of fighting against against each other so those were our motivations for building uh, out the app as far as specific use cases um, as I've mentioned uh, borrowing against equity and future revenue is a big one um, refinancing loans and very specifically to the fourth DAO uh, which uh, we're going to talk more on this later but um, one of the major use cases uh, coming up will be overseeing the spot launch, which um, could include using Hourglass to mint more spot or the initial um, liquidity for spot. Or I, I saw in the governance channel that um, there was talk of using Hourglass to take out a loan to acquire stable coins uh, to pair with spot and create some of these pools. Um, so we'll talk more on that, I think, um, a little bit later. but um those are sort of the major use cases we see at least for the fourth DAO upcoming very soon and uh, i guess on that note while i'm talking about it uh, there is several posts in the governance uh, forums um we currently have um, a poll out for the parameters of the bonds that uh, you can go vote on right now to see if the ones that we have currently are favorable or if the community would like new ones deployed. Um, and tying into that point, um, when we launched, uh, you might notice that there is no way to create bonds through the interface. And um, basically our initial idea was to get the app out um, in a state that it can be used uh, for spot launch. And uh, to issue the bonds, we would just work with uh, the teams that wanted to create them and we would sort of just do it behind the scenes in Etherscan. Um, however, uh, in the last few days, we have created uh, a new UI element um, that will allow users to create uh, bonds themselves uh, without our help. And one of the big advantages of this um, is that currently, if you have fourth tokens and you want to borrow against them, um, well, currently other than Hourglass, I don't believe there is um, a great way to do that. But even through Hourglass, um, with, with uh, the past few days, if you want to borrow with your fourth tokens, you're sort of at the mercy of the fourth DAO activating the bonds we currently have listed. And um, I'll get more into how these bonds go through their life cycles, but essentially only the owner of the bond can activate the bond. And so the owner of the bonds we have currently listed are the wallet address of the fourth DAO. And so if you've been um, participating in these initial bonds, and you want to be a borrower, then unfortunately you're sort of at the mercy of uh, the fourth DAO to go and activate those bonds. Um, however, with this new um, UI page that we've created, individuals can now create their own bonds where they are the owner and they can activate it at any time. So what that means is if anyone in the community has fourth tokens that they want to borrow against, Let's say you have uh, 104 tokens, for example, and you create a bond and you put all 104 in there. Um, you know, it, it depends on what your parameters are, of course, and how you set up your tranche ratios. But as long as you can find lending demand 
uh, to match uh, your borrowing needs, then you can activate your bond immediately um, to execute that loan. So um, ex expect that in the next uh, couple of days, and we'll also announce it in Discord and through Twitter when that's available for um, individuals to use. So uh, I think I saw early on that there is like some there's maybe some misconceptions that Hourglass is only for DAOs. And that's that's not true, and that's especially not true with this new um, create a bond page that we worked on. Uh, it's it's for anyone. Anyone can use the app to borrow or lend. It's not just for DAOs. Although we think the biggest use case is for DAOs. So uh, I encourage individuals to use it um, to lend and borrow as they see fit. It's not um, exclusively for DAOs. It's for everyone. So. Uh, with that being said, very quickly, um, I'll just go through uh, the three states that a bond can be in. Uh, we have IBO, which is the initial bond offering, uh, activated, and then mature. So those are the three major uh, steps. And basically the way it works is when you issue a new bond through Hourglass, it will start in the IBO phase. Um, and this is used to basically um, see what the demand, the lending demand is going to be like for a specific bond with its uh, configured parameters. And so um, with the IBO, it's essentially um, like an escrow account um, where everyone puts uh, the initial um, slips or I'm sorry, the, uh, you get slips back, uh, which rep represent your willingness to either be a borrower or a lender. And whoever issued the bond, and in this case, let's say it's a DAO, uh, if, if they see that everything is how they want it, they see that there's enough lending demand for how much they're wanting to borrow, then after the IBO phase, uh, they can change the bond to active and at that point uh orders can be executed and uh, loans can be taken and funds can be lent and so that that kicks off the uh, life cycle of the bond so if you made it for 90 days um, that's when the bond starts and it will run for 90 days and at the end of those 90 days then the bond becomes mature and everyone gets what they're due so if if uh, the borrower was able to repay everything before maturity, then the lender will get their uh, stable coins back plus the interest of whatever the bond was. However, if the borrower defaults, then the lender will get um, the equity collateral that was put in by the borrower. And so, um, a major benefit to DAOs uh, with this system is one, it's a zero commitment deployment, which means um, a bond can be created in its IBO phase without any funds ever leaving uh, the DAO's wallet. So um, in a typical system, you might require a governance vote to pass to even issue a bond. But with Hourglass, um, because no no funds need to be, be moved up front, anyone from the community could create the bond themselves and put the owner address as the, the DAO's wallet address. And funds will never have to be moved until the DAO decides and votes to actually activate and execute um, the orders and send the bond to its activated phase. Um, so uh, with that, I guess I'll either... I mean, if, if there's any questions, please put them in a general ch chat or any chat that we can see, and we'll try to answer any questions. Um, if there are no questions, I guess I'll hand it back to um, Simon to see what's next on, on the agenda. Yeah, we'll just wait a second for any questions to like filter through. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, and thanks for giving the overview. That proposal you alluded to is the one we're going to chat about at the end of this session, just to this provide an avenue for people to sort of discuss where they're thinking. Obviously, they can take part in the um, on the forum itself, but sometimes people can have a good opportunity to kind of discuss what's happening here. We'll just give it one more minute, and then we can uh, see what's, what kind of questions come through. I think we can do is people can ask questions really at any time. If the Buttonwood guys want to join the stage and if um, Alavantan and Brandon want to hop on up, we can have a more broad ecosystem style discussion. I know there's been plenty of cross work between um, the teams, all three teams really. And so it'd be interesting to just kind of discuss that if Matt or Fiddlekins want, want to hop up as well. And to the rundown on system, uh, some really uh, great work. It's really cool to see the project turn into what it has. Um, I remember first seeing it back in the hackathon days way back then. So it's super cool to see you guys reach market. That's definitely nothing, uh, no small task. Yeah, thank you very much. For sure. I'd, I'd pile on that, that the same sentiment. And then I'd also say it's exciting to see the utility of this beyond fourth certainly like we're it's great that the fourth DAO made the grant but it's something that looks like it's going to help the space more broadly than just DAOs. but as you highlighted this is something that could be a really useful tool for many DAOs so beyond just the fourth DAO. yeah i was gonna say um so we've been working pretty closely with them um as far as like design business development all that i think uh one thing that they didn't do the best job of like emphasizing is like this is in some ways like the perfect time for uh this kind of product uh for a lot of DAOs with their sorry background noise with their uh, native token being crushed and not wanting to sell at these low prices to put further sell pressure on um they can now borrow against that uh and potentially extend runway um and obviously do any of those other activities um i know like some for example we're talking to one DAO and like their contributors are getting paid with their native token. Like they don't want to get paid with a token that's just going down and down and like they want to get paid with stable coins. Um, so this is another way for DAOs to basically borrow against that, get access to stable coins, um, be able to pay contributors, grants, all that kind of stuff in addition to like any other operating expenses, so. Yeah, absolutely, thank you, man. Yeah, I think it also that that highlights a problem. Brandon says it best, not not to put you on the spot, Brandon, but a lot of these and you could take over any moment here. But a, a lot of DAOs are rich in their singular DAO token, and that becomes a very big problem for them. Um, yeah, I think DAOs basically have the two big problems facing every DAO. Um, one is concentration of, of their treasury. Um, so they want to find a way to diversify their assets without putting down pressure on the project token itself. And then two is how do you access liquidity from that, I think. And this helps solve kind of both of those. That's right. And I think there's yeah. a... Go ahead, Matt. Yep. All right. Just another uh, interesting use case as like Hourglass and, and I were talking to this one team is there's like another, I guess, somewhat competitor bond or protocol, which is like the bond protocol from Olympus. Um, and basically, I think what uh, I, someone can correct me if I'm explaining it the wrong way, but basically, these DAOs are selling their native tokens at a discount, and then those tokens are automatically locked up and they don't vest for a certain amount of time. Um, so the theory is like you wouldn't be putting sell pressure on that because the tokens are locked up. But what was actually happening is the people that were long term community members or long term believers. That already held the token we're just buying those tokens at a discount selling their existing holdings and just making a profit there by like are being that away um so like this is a better product than that for many DAOs, uh our glasses that is but yeah and um matt makes a good point um you know one of one of the biggest like or you know there's a lot of benefits to our glass but um another one is as he mentioned 
this this is extremely safe for DAOs to use, um, as there is there's literally no uh, unless they don't repay the loan, then there's no sell pressure and they get to keep their t they keep their equity token no matter what. And no liquidations is like the biggest, I guess, thing too. We don't have to worry about. Yeah, absolutely. And those, um, you, know, you you mentioned you don't have to worry about um, liquidations. I guess we can also briefly mention like the the tranche ratios are completely configurable um, through Hourglass. So I think the ones we have listed, I think one's twenty eighty. Um, so. As many of you know, that means uh, the fourth price could go down 80% before uh, the safe A tranches would ever be affected, which, uh, as it was pointed out, I think in the governance forum, had uh, had you participated in a bond um, with the 2080 ratios a month ago, even with this massive drop we've seen in the last uh, week or two, the A tranches would still be safe and and would have retained their value, which is, you know, absolutely needed for DAOs right now who need to continue to uh, push forward through the bear market and still pay their employees. And, uh, you know, like these companies don't just stop because there's a bear market, right? Like they have to continue, they have to be able to continue to operate through these um, tough times, which we think our loss can really help with. Yeah, so breather on that note, can you um, describe briefly what happens in the event of a default? So if the bond gets repaid in full, principal and interest, then I think that's pretty clear. What happens if there's a partial repayment or, or no repayment? In the event of no repayment, um, the, uh, well, so what I want to mention first is, um, so there's actually a, a parameter that we have um, for a penalty and this sort of ties into the question. Uh, so if the penalty is an extra parameter or an extra percentage that can be configured that says in the event of us defaulting on our loan, uh, the lender will get uh, our collateral um, that we put in, like the equity collateral, but then they're also going to get an additional uh, like, let's say, for example, an additional 5%, right? If the penalty is 5%, then uh, the lender is going to get an additional 5%. Uh, and the reason we have that is because it's it's an additional incentive uh, for lenders because if they see, um, you know, maybe a, a really high penalty um, on one of the bonds, well, one, that means that the Dow isn't scared of defaulting on their loan um, and it gives lenders sort of like a, a risk profile to chase after um, so you know let's say the penalty is like i don't know something like really high like 30 or 40 percent that would show uh lenders that the dow doesn't plan on defaulting be because that would be a huge penalty to pay and so um to get back to your question uh, in the in the event of a total default, uh, the lender would just get um, the the collateral equity that was deposited plus the penalty of of whatever the the DAP configured. Um, and then uh, I'll hand it off to G. Uh, I think he might be able to answer the uh, partial repayment a little better than I can. Yeah, so for uh, partial repayment, it's basically we have this um, uh, this function that essentially like says like what the bond price is from the time of activation to uh, to maturity. So it's basically just like a straight linear function. So if you're partially repaying, uh, basically what you owe is just the interest accrued up until that point. Um, and basically what you would get is um, like uh, like whatever like one bond one uh, bond slip is divided by like that that price at the time of um, at the time of repayment is how many uh, is how many uh, bond slips you get back and each bond slip is is essentially equivalent to to one a tranche so uh, so yeah partial repayment essentially just means that um, you only owe the interest like up until that point and and 
and you still get back the A tranches according to this price function, basically. Is that is that clear, Brandon? Anyone else? Uh, I think so. Um, can you say? Let's see. So there is a difference between early repayment, which in which case you might just um, owe less interest because it's had less right. time to accrue. And then there's also the case of like partial repayment at the time of maturity where you, you're not able to cover the. the oh, right, right, right. Well, no, right. Partial repayment. Uh, so, so yeah, at the time of maturity. Um, so it's basically what you're looking at is at maturity, each um, safe slip is, or each bond slip rather is, is, is just $1, right? So if you're doing a partial repayment, then um, however many stable coins you provide that, that's how many, um, that's how many tranche tokens you get back. And whatever you don't get back is uh, uh, is essentially like reserved for uh, reserved for the lenders, right? So you can put uh, the amount of like um, like bond tokens that you get, um, like you're able to pay back all of them or some of them. Um, and basically, the amount of stable coins you provide uh, will determine how many trash tokens you get back. Okay. Cool. Thanks. I think that was a pretty great rundown of the system um, and, and how it works, the important details, et cetera. Uh, and unless somebody has questions, I'll, I'll check really quickly. I think it'd be a good time to maybe hop into the, oh, there's a question from Carpe Diem and Bear Mahler asked if there'd be a video walkthrough and Bear Mahler said, yeah, possibly. Um, it'd be a good time to walk through this proposal and, and I'm going to mispronounce this. So please do correct me, but bow put a proposal forward in the, um, ample fourth governance forum. And it, it, it's, it was outlined a minute ago by, um, the hourglass team, but if bow, if you want to discuss it quickly, given outline of what it is now that we know, um, how hourglass works, it'd be good to kick that discussion off. So let me see if we can get you up on the stage to do that. If you can, let's see if you can raise your hand. Perfect. Hey, yeah, thanks, Simon. No problem. Uh, you can pronounce my name as Bao is the way it's said, but Bao is cool too, either way. Bao. Um, Got it. Yep. Yeah, but uh, really, um, Really cool product, Hourglass. Congrats again. Really excited to see where this goes. And I read, I've, I've been kind of just to give you some background. I've been studying these apps for some time now, but these things are finally coming together. So it's not just out of the blue that I'm posting these things. It's just kind of making sense now. And um, after the initial bonds were proposed by the Hourglass team, I looked at it and I thought, why don't we, um, why don't we make something more? attractive and alluring to market participants. And that's the reason I proposed it. And I kind of just um, included some images and a walkthrough to help further clarify the way it works. And I hope it makes sense. And I'd love to clarify any um, questions that people might have. Yeah, it sounds good for sure. If anyone on stage has a question, go ahead and, and ask it. If anyone in the audience wants to stand up on stage and ask a question, that's great. Um, otherwise, I'll keep an eye on the chat. If we haven't yet, can we paste a link to the, the forum post? Yeah, we did. I think Matt just did it. Um, yeah. And if there aren't questions, uh, like initially, I, I think sometimes getting talking about things can elicit some of those questions as people kind of wrap their head around it a little bit more or as the conversation gets going. So there are some parameters and other items that are outstanding. I, I, obviously, there's a poll. Um, Bob, do you mind uh, kind of talking about some of those parameters and which ones you think are key to identify or, you know, which ones out of, obviously you put the proposal forward, but maybe um, you've got, you're leaning one way or another. I'm like not certain what the community would lean toward. Um, that could be good use of sure. time here. Uh, yeah, so the, the parameters, I mean, I, I uh, added them after referencing the original post by Hourglass. And um, the, the interest rate is, uh, I think at the other post, it's listed in terms of as an APR. This interest rate is really just over the three month, uh, 90 day duration. So basically a bond will be bought by the lender uh, on day zero. 
And then over the next 90 days, that bond will uh, accrue an interest of 25%, which is pretty good for somebody lending in this kind of market, I would say. And um, if we did a 20-80 ratio, then the fourth DAO, the fourth token can sustain a drop of 80% before um, the lender is compromised in any way. If we did a 40-60 ratio, then it's 60% loss that the fourth token can sustain. And um, I mean, I, I think DAI is a pretty good stable coin to take, but I think any stable coin would be good because they're all comfortable for the most part. And yeah, the penalty, I think somebody earlier mentioned 20-30% um, probably sounds even better, but we need kind of some good confidence before that 5% is not bad. And um, yeah, I, I hope that helps explain what I'm saying here. Uh, sure. Yeah. Thanks, Bob. Um, so I think it's, you know, as a community around, around the DAO, it's really important for us to look at um, the context around a loan before we take out any kind of borrowing against our, our assets. Uh, so ideally, you know, if we take a loan, it's because we have something uh, particularly we want to do with those assets. Um, and then that kind of informs how much return we might expect from those, which might inform the, the um, parameters of the loan as well. Um, so right now, as far as the DAO is concerned, it's, it's pretty lean. Like it's primarily focused on governance of the Ampleforth protocol so far. Um, it does have a treasury with, with a few different assets, um, mostly fourth, but also a fair amount of Ample and then some, some others like, um, like the graph tokens and that sort of thing. Um, so right now the DAO doesn't, because it's so lean, it doesn't really have many expenditures as to cover, um, aside from kind of basics like um, infrastructure, like uh, oracles and that sort of thing. Um, and so there's not a, a pressing need for uh, liquidity necessarily at the moment, but there's a question about what we could do with it if we had it, right? And so um, a couple of different ideas that people have thrown around, uh, one promising one could be to just take the stables and pair it with spot to increase spot liquidity around launch. Um, the size of that would depend on how much spot we're able to mint, which which I think we'll need to sort of wait and see based off of the market conditions around rollout time. Um, and then uh, the the revenue or return we would get from that liquidity would depend on the fees that we would get from that LP position in, in the marketplace. Um, and you know, before any spot markets exist, it's really hard to say what that would look like right now. Um, one like floor level potentially as comparison could be the return on stable coin pools on unity three or, or curve right and so i think the return on those for the most part um seems to be around like 0.5 percent to 0.7 percent some outliers like i think it was die usdc on unity three was one one and a half percent i'm not sure you can necessarily count on that so unless there's uh you know some future uh, cash flow into the Dow Treasury. If we took out a loan greater than, you know, those ballpark numbers, I think there's a very good chance that uh, we would end up doing a partial repayment. So that would not be the, the full repayment, including all the all the interest. Um, and so I just wanted to put that sort of out there as broader context around whether the Dow should should take a, a loan against its assets or not. Um, but there are also potentially many other ideas people could have on what to do with that liquidity. So I think when we talk about the parameters, we should put it in the context of, of the use case as well. Yeah, to that to that end, I also suggested potentially taking the percentage of the loan and just um, uh, buying some Ample with it if uh, the Ample spot system will be launching soon. That way, whatever we take and buy with the Ample or with the stable coins, the Ample we buy, it expands and that may cover the, the loan uh, interest we have to pay. But I mean, that's kind of a risky strategy. I don't want to put things up to chance like that. Yeah, it's interesting. It would be sort of um, leveraging against uh, another ecosystem token. Um, yeah. Right, yeah. Some risk. Yeah. It's some risk, but I think you guys have designed that system to really stratify and buffer pretty well, if I understand it correctly. But I don't know how it's going to play out. In any case, it seems like there's no uh, time time limit for um, taking off this bond. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. If we were to take one of the existing IBOs. 
Correct. Yeah. It's um, yeah. Like any any maturity like length, and also you can activate it like, like whenever you want. Type of thing. Um, so yeah, there's 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 no time specification there. I think the one thing that's tough about just having no time is trying to get the lending demand because um, I mean, if people are free to deposit funds and then remove them as they see fit, but every time they do that, I think they have to pay to pay some form of gas. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think trying to get everybody to identify some kind of like issuance state. Obviously, you guys, Brandon, as you said, you don't really know what the Whole spot dynamics going to be yet, but I guess I was just saying for future rounds. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, I think if we wanted to do the strategy of um, sort of getting acquiring some ample by leveraging against fourth, if we we probably do that in anticipation of the spot launch, so that's something that we might want to do earlier rather than later. If our goal is to provide liquidity for spot, then we'll have more knowledge. Um, when we're able to start minting spot. So, so I think you know, those aspects would impact our timing. I guess why no one's talking, G, I don't know if you explain, I think I'm not positive, but when you talk about the partial repayment, so from a lender perspective, you would get some stable coins back and then you would get some fourth as a senior tranche holder in the form of um yeah in the form of fourth which is like the native token and then that would be like equivalent to what you'd be getting on stable coin which you then could go sell on like the market and then from the borrower's perspective you'd be paying back some of the stable coin loan which would unlock some of your collateral but then you'd be kind of forgetting that the rest of your collateral to the senior tranche holders is that correct uh, no, it's slightly different than that. So as a lender, you can only like redeem for either stables or um, or the tranche token. Um, so it's it's not like a like a typical like fair value based system. It's it's, it's uh, as a lender, um, you can only redeem for one or the other. So yeah, basically the way the partial repayment. I guess you have to explain it a little better. Um, as a DAO, as a borrower, um, you retain like all of your Z tranche, like no matter what, like whether you repay uh, full, or repay partial, repay nothing you always retain your um, your Z tranche tokens. And then uh, basically, if you want to do a partial repayment, it's just one for one, right? Like $1 for one tranche token at the end. Um, and so, so yeah, there's obviously based off of however many Z tranche tokens you have, uh, multiply that by the tranche ratio to, you know, uh, to, to calculate like how many A tranches you, you're able to buy back, right? And, you know, this is $1 for one tranche token at, at maturity, right? And, as a lender, you can only redeem for one or the other. So you don't, uh, as a borrower, you don't need to pay off that full ratio uh, because the lender can only redeem for one or the other. So in that case, the lenders, if they can only redeem for one token or the other, is there some sort of ordering? So if people um, claim all of the stables first, then everyone else gets um, the correct tranche tokens to be left over. Yeah, that's the correct. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it's first time. Okay. It looks like we had a question about um, if you had Z tranche, where could you sell it? Uh, you can take it to the Buttonwood auction protocol and see if anyone wants to buy it there. I don't know if Fids or Matt want to talk more about auctions, but you could potentially create a, a Z tranche market there in, in some way. Uh, yeah, I can I can chip in here real quick. Um, as as, as Simon mentioned, we have a an auctions platform, um, and it provides the ability to do double sided auctions. So you can take two arbitrary USC twenty tokens, and people can place bids and ask uh, to to those um, to find some sort of price point that is mutually agreeable. Um, actually, drop a link to it. Uh, Uh, but yeah, so for something like um, the Z tranches, where they're, well, they're, they're a very illiquid asset, because we, if you were an LPA, um, trying to LP for a Z tranche token pairing, you're quite likely to run into a permanent loss that you will never, uh, never get away from, um, due to the combination of the high volatility of the price 
and the fact that it has a maturity date. So once it hits that maturity date, you just have to stop LPing. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's, the dust is settled, and whatever impairment loss you experience uh, is finalized at that point. Um, so because it's quite a liquid market, it's, it's the perfect candidate for something like an auction platform, um, which allows you to... Uh, did I link the wrong thing? Sorry, I linked the wrong thing. Uh, one moment. Too many tabs. <laughs> Yeah, there's the uh, there's the auction thing. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, actually, just to add on to that, um, currently the auction platform uh, only allows anybody to create an auction on testnet. Um, but sometime this month we will have a expanded version, um, which makes it possible for anybody to create the auctions. Um, so if you pay attention to it, you'll you'll catch wind of when that happens. Looking forward to that, fiddle skins. The uh, other thing I'm also wondering is just it just occurred to me is upon maturity, when uh, both the lender or the borrower want to uh, redeem the tranches, have you guys had a chance to model or simulate how that might affect the token price and who redeems it first, how that might change things? Uh, is this is this fabric loss bonds especially or is the ones in general? Uh, yeah, I mean, in general, I'd say. Yeah. Um, it's not something we've done any particular uh, search on, as it were. Um, my general expectation would be you know, if, there's a, if there's a rush to sell the bond collateral and the first mover is going to be best well off. Um, but apart from that, I, mean, I guess that's an incentive as well for users to uh, mature the bond themselves rather than waiting for somebody else to do it. Um, so, I mean, apart from that, I mean, uh, can we have any particular thoughts? I guess it would depend a whole lot on the particularities of the market you're looking at. So um, there might be some projects where people are looking to get, um, you know, stake in uh, a token at, at discount, and some people might be looking primarily for a return on stables. Um, and so, in the case of Hourglass, my my hunch, although we have to observe this too, is that anyone who's um, lending stables for some sort of fixed rate is probably trying to you know, make their return in stables too. And so I guess that a lot of the web lenders would be likely to liquidate their, their bonds when they mature. Yeah. 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 So, so the only thing to add was that um, I think we've touched on this briefly in some of our like, the tree sessions, but uh, one of the things somewhere effectively in the roadmap for Buttonwood is to start working on some folks which actually allow users to um, engage in these investment strategies with other coins they want, like stable coins probably. Um, uh, but the, the actual votes will then sort of uh, handle, handle the rotating between different bonds that matures. Um, so uh, under circumstances like that, you know, users won't be rushing to the market per se, and uh, it's probably more predictable um, and more ordered, more orderly. Um, in terms of sort of how you go from one one maturing to uh, the next one starting up. Um, so sort of longer term, I think there's going to be a sort of a, a smoothing of those corners anyway. Makes sense. And the more active the markets are, so like the, the more vintages of bonds there are kind of in circulation, uh, the less of the race condition exists that you talked about, Philippines. Makes sense. I mean, as an example of uh, what I just said, actually, in spot, um, that would be a situation where you have, again, these rotating bonds, right? So, you know, liquidity is sort of flowing from one bond to the next. So there might be some buying and selling in between. Uh, ultimately, it's just flowing from one bond to the next one. So um, market price of the raw asset shouldn't change significantly over time as, as the result of bond mature. It's just first come, first serve, first serve. I mean, anybody can just go to the website upon maturity and redeem it on either side. Oh, it sounds like you're talking about so, Yeah, yeah, it's uh, basically, it's, um, yeah, and it's not for sure. Um, actually, so as soon as tables are repaid, any lender can go in. So even if you like an early repayment, uh, a lender can go in before maturity and, and redeem it. Um, and basically what they get is, uh, they get like an average repayment price. So let's say you do, uh, 
repayments at like a quarter of the way to maturity and uh, halfway to maturity and three quarters of the way to maturity and the stables are just in the uh, in the bond the lender can go in and basically what they'll get back is an average repayment price uh, according to that function that i shared earlier but um uh, but yeah at maturity um it, it sort of yeah any lender can go in and they can uh you know redeem the stables or the tranche tokens that are there and if it's uh default then then does the lender get the first say well if the if the borrower has like defaulted completely then they're the lender is sort of like at um they, they're sort of left they're sort of forced, I guess, to only redeem the tranches unless they want to like continue waiting for the borrower to repay that, repay back. But assuming the borrower is not going to like repay it uh, after after maturity and they're sort of like definitely defaulting and and they uh, the borrower redeems their Z tranches, then then the lender is forced to redeem their A tranches. So then the borrower gets to redeem the Z tranches first. It doesn't matter. Yeah, that doesn't matter. It, it, that doesn't need to require it. That, that does not need to happen in any order. It's uh, if the lender wants to redeem their A tranches before, um, then uh, then they can do that. Gotcha. Um, a slight change of topic, but um, I just want to sort of throw that hat around. And that is, you know, as we celebrate our glass getting their work to completion, um, it's just fun to think back to about a year from back, back from now as a chain in Cacathon, which spawned our glass in the first place. Um, and back then, a friend of Mark gave a talk about asset finance and sort of well, the sort of philosophy of design uh, is very, very robust, um, very good at sort of underpinning lots of complex financial uh, machinery. And um, again, a year on from then, we have our glass to good demonstration of how this all, all goes together yeah, cool. yeah that's a great point uh fits uh at, like like i i guess yeah one thing we did touch on i guess was like when we went into the hackathon we <laughs> like we didn't we weren't planning on like uh i guess we weren't even like thinking about like actually doing this as like an actual protocol it was sort of just we were going in just to see what um see what the prl team had made at that point and i think it was this was even before their mainnet launch and I, I think uh, I can't speak for the others, but like for me, I, I find it um, like very uh, refreshing, I guess, like how easy it was to understand the like buttonwood contracts and the, and the design. And it, um, it, it, it speaks to like how well it's designed that we were able to take it and, you know, without having, you know, much experience beforehand, how we were able to take it and, um, you know, uh, and, and build something out of it, the, the composability of that, of that system. So, yeah, I think uh, in the future, we'll, We'll definitely see like even more stuff um, built on top of it. I think that's a really good point. You know, it, not everyone has to share this view, but when you look at the space as a whole, and, and a number of us have been through some bear and bull cycles, you sometimes there's a dearth of things that are happening, but it's, it seems to me like a very bright spot of what's happening in the space overall, and it and it's all interlinking technology in a lot of ways. So. We've got Buttonwood, who's releasing a tech, which is empowering both Spot as well as Hourglass. Um, and the interplay between these and then the outreach, it can go into different, um, just because Hourglass can reach into other DAOs, into other projects as well. It's creating sort of a, an exciting beacon of, of innovation here. Uh, so it is nice to see all the projects working well together, utilizing the tech in interesting ways to create some innovative uh, solutions to real problems. Um, and yeah, it's something that definitely catches my eye and hopefully coach catches the eye of others as well. Yeah, I think um, this philosophical shift um, is a real one from the existing DeFi that we've seen so far. And I think it's probably the best claim there is to any kind of reinvention of DeFi. And so it's really cool to see all these technologies that come out and work together where they are. Yeah, I think it's really fantastically laid out in that um that chart by button zero, where they uh, show how DeFi is really broken down to tranching and transferring. I think that really people need to understand that more deeply. Yeah, and I think um, <clears throat> Brandon may have mentioned it in the video during the hackathon, but um, one of the cool things also about uh, what Buttonwood has made is uh, Hourglass was built completely with no oracles um, since we built on top of their architecture. We did have to set up the fourth oracle, but that was more for the buttonwood side than it was for us. Um, so it's like as as you continue to build up the stack, 
from like an engineering perspective, it sort of just gets easier and easier as all of that stuff gets abstracted away down lower. Yeah, and at least within the Amber Fourth project, we've been throwing around this term decentralized unit of account for a couple of years now. <laughs> if you like, um, for so long, no one really understood what that meant, but now you can actually see what it means very, very directly. And I think um, Simon may have, like was maybe sort of hinting at this a little bit with me was mentioning um, Hourglass sort of being a beacon. I think. Um, as it was mentioned, uh, this product initially was um, four fourth, but it's sort of been expanded to where any DAO uh, is able to use it. And you know, I think this is a good chance for um, more exposure to Ample and Fourth, in that uh, maybe you know maybe there's people who aren't familiar with Ample Fourth uh, project, and you know maybe they're coming to, to buy some bond from another project and a few months go by or a year and people start noticing like, you know, Hey, these, you know, some of these companies or, or these DAOs have defaulted on their, on their loans. But, uh, we've noticed that this, you know, this fourth, this fourth DAO always repays and they always do things, you know, on time. And that could, it's, it's almost like sort of a, a good marketing, like free marketing in a way. Um, if people just notice that the DAO is, profiting and paying their loans back and, and doing things correctly. So I think that's a cool, like a cool plus side too. Well, I think we could probably um, think about wrapping there. It was, uh, it was really nice to have everyone up here. Th th a little bit about what you're saying there, Sunbreeder. Th this is one of a real rising tide can lift all boats situation. If people find spot or if people find hourglass coming in through different DAOs, they're going to invariably touch some tech uh, put forward via Buttonwood and via Nimble Navigators. And it's sort of a calling card for everyone in the space. If they bump into any one of the projects that was up on stage today, they can very readily find any of the other projects and see that interplay. Um, so I think that, that that's like another way of repackaging what you said. But it, that is a, an optimistic note to end on, which I, I always prefer to do if we can. So thanks again for all joining. Um, for sure, follow everybody's Twitter, the Nimble Navigators Twitter, the Buttonwood Twitter, um, the Ampleforth.org uh, Twitter, and then the Discords as well.